Tell us a little bit about the uh, film, uh, Harmony. It's very controversial, isn't it? Yeah. Is this drawn on personal experience? Tell the folks what it is, and then tell me where it came from. Well, it's funny. Because, well, it's strange because I guess it's controversial, but I haven't. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I just wanted to make a sequel to Caddyshack, uh -huh. and um, for some. And, and then I used to live by this guy, and he was a Hasidic um, Jewish, and he played the basket. And he always played with basketballs. And he also, his father was a dentist. But once I was walking down the street, and he said, "You're a sinner," like that. Said that to you? Yeah. So I just wrote it. <clears throat> Once I took this kid sailing, and his name was Barfunk, and I and I capsized the sailboat, uh -huh. and he and he almost drowned. Wow. <laughs> Harmony Corrine, man, myth, absolute legend. Son of a tap dancer turned documentarian who fell in love with cinema through a Werner Herzog film titled Even Dwarves Started Small, an absurdist film that obviously had a hand in his later works. Corrine spent the early 80s being a tyrant, skateboarding, getting into fights and other deviant activities, and didn't have the idea of filmmaking until he started high school. He took a semester of dramatic writing before dropping out to become a professional skateboarder. If um, God thinks highly of me or not so much, uh, I knew this one girl who she told me about meeting Bruce Willis one day and asking for his autograph. And once I seen that guy, um, Phil Collins, buying a pair of cowboy boots, or I don't think that much the way a girl don't talk to me, or if she thinks something bad about me, or I don't, I don't know. I I just kind of let it go by, or go by me. Yes, don't matter. In the early 90s, Kareen was skateboarding in Washington Square Park where he was approached by Larry Clark, who we'll move on to talk about in another video. Clark was impressed and asked Kareen to write a script about skaters and the teenage experience. And if you've seen kids, you know how shocking it became, especially with how young the cast was and the subject matter but like I said, we'll definitely dive more into that. In 1997, Corrine wrote and directed Gummo and the rest was history. I won't be going into all of his films, but I did choose to focus on a handful that I think are significant, especially if you're trying to dive into the darker and grittier side of cinema. We're going to be talking about Gummo, 1997, Julian Donkey Boy, 1999, Trash Humpers, 2009, Spring Breakers, 2012, with a special mention of Umshimi Wam from 2011 starring Di Antwoord. <coughs> Harmony Corrine was introduced to me at a very young age. I was 11 or 12 the first time I saw Gummo. My uncle, who had a huge hand in my love for movies, showed me this strange yellow DVD case with a strange boy on the cover. I sat through it. I was disgusted by the bathtub scene. I fell in love with Chloe Sevigny and her bleached eyebrows and so much more in 90 minutes. It was transformative for me. I now have that same strange yellow DVD in my collection. It was left for me when my uncle passed away along with his entire movie collection. And I took that love of cinema and started this channel and today I bring you a deep dive on Harmony Corrine, the man who first piqued my interest into the darker side of film. 
Join me as we take a look at how Harmony Kareen turned depravity and despair into fascinating and intriguing artwork. Spoiler warning and content warning in effect. Let's begin with Gummo from 1997, where teen friends Tumblr and Solomon navigate the ruins of a tiny tornado ravaged town in Ohio that is populated by the deformed, disturbed, and depraved. When not gunning down stray cats for a few bucks, the boys spend their time getting high on household inhalants. Elsewhere, a mute named Bunny Boy wears bunny ears and is bullied by kids half his age. Meanwhile, sisters Dot and Helen dodge a pedophile. Helen, how you doing? Hey. hey What's up with you? Good? Okay. Corrine wanted to completely abandon the three-act plot structure to avoid creating characters of clear-cut moral dimension. The film instead is pieced together like a strange collage of moments and interesting scenes. He justifies the chaos by setting the film in Xenia, Ohio, which was hit by a tornado in 1974. In pre-production, Kareen scouted locations in his hometown of Nashville, Tennessee, and I want you to keep this location in mind as we progress through this video. He was looking for specific and distinct homes to shoot at. He also approached people in bowling alleys, on the street, and in fast food places to play a part in the movie. Corrine noted, quote, This is where I grew up. These people are interesting to me, and I've never seen them represented in a true way. Two of the main actors were spotted on television. Solomon, played by Jacob Reynolds, was in a short role in The Road to Wellville. Kareen said he was so visual. I never get tired of looking at his face. He was also described as looking like no other kid in the world. Tumblr, played by Nick Sutton, was also spotted on an episode of Sally Jesse Raphael titled, My Child Died From Sniffing Paint. On the show, Sutton was asked where he thinks he'll be in a few years, and he responded, I don't know, probably dead. Corrine recalled, I saw his face, and that was the boy I dreamed of. That was my Tumblr. There was a beauty about him. Nick Sutton is now 40 years old. Come on, can you smile for me, please? Okay, you son of a bitch, if you don't smile, I'm gonna kill you, okay? I've killed before and I will kill again. I will pick up your brains all over the floor. Actors for Gummo were cast not on how they read lines, but by the visual aura they put off instead. A lot of the actors in the film are visually striking, and it definitely feels that way. Gummo did end up filming in Nashville, but mostly the poorest areas. Producer Carrie Woods was quoted saying, we're essentially seeing the kind of poverty we're used to seeing in third world countries when crews are covering famine, but we're seeing this in the heart of America. One small house they shot in housed 15 people and several cockroaches. At times, the crew refused to film in such conditions and forced Corrine to buy hazmat suits to wear while filming. Kareen and his cinematographer often wore speedos and flip-flops to piss everyone off. Improv and spontaneity were encouraged on set. A great amount of trust was formed with the actors. Kareen was quoted saying, If an actor is a crack smoker, let him go out in between takes, smoke crack, and then come back and throw his refrigerator out the window. Let people do whatever they like without consequence. He was also quoted saying, I wanted to show what it was like to sniff glue. I didn't want to judge anybody. This is why I have very little interest in working with actors. Non-actors can give you what working actors can't. 
a piece of themselves. The final film was only about 75% scripted. Nay, I wanna be. Gummo explores a wide range of issues. Drug abuse, violence, homicide, mental illness, poverty, profanity, homophobia, sexual abuse, sexism, racism, suicide, grief, prostitution, and animal cruelty. It premiered at the 24th annual Telluride Film Festival on August 29, 1997, during which Several people walked out during the opening scene where a cat is drowned and eaten. You hit it or my bed or my fucking bed and what are you doing it? What are you doing it? What are you doing it? Answer, answer, answer me, answer me, answer me. I got you. Dude, don't do me move. Don't you move. Sit down, have a cup of tea. <laughs> Only joke. Come on, come on, come on in. Julian Donkey Boy from 1999 is essentially a portrait of the effects of schizophrenia on family life with a focus on titular Julian, a man with schizophrenia and his dysfunctional family. The character of Julian is based on Harmony Corrine's schizophrenic uncle, Eddie. To prepare for the film, Corrine had star Elwin Bremner meet his uncle and later listen to audio of him to prepare for his role. <coughs> oh my God. Speaking of stars of the film, remember when I mentioned Werner Herzog at the beginning of this video? Kareen fell in love with cinema through a Werner Herzog film, like I mentioned, and for a full circle moment, majority of the film's budget was used for work visas for Werner Herzog and Elwin Bremner to be in the film. Imagine idolizing a filmmaker only to have him star in your film. There was originally a script, but in Harmony Korean fashion, the dialogue was 95% improvised. And I feel like improvisation makes it feel so much more based in realism. Along with improv came spy cameras. For a number of scenes, including when Julian carries a dead fetus on a public bus, Kareen used hidden spy cameras to capture the most genuine reactions from the unsuspecting public. For a short time, the film was called The Julian Chronicles, and during the 25-day shoot, 86 hours of footage was shot. It was later cut down to 101 minutes, but the first cut was six and a half hours long. This film furthers the exploration and conversation around mental health, and Corrine never pulls any punches when showing the most harrowing parts of it. Sawani Avenue. Okay, let's move into arguably uh, the most odd film in this list and possibly the most inaccessible, Trash Humbers from 2009. As we follow a gang of elderly individuals as they masturbate to trash, trespass, vandalize, destroy property, and disturb the peace. 
They participate in a variety of depraved and unpleasant activities. For example, making two men in hospital gowns eat pancakes covered in dish soap. All of their activities include elements of peer pressure, and there is very little dialogue throughout this film, and much of it incoherent. You don't really understand the importance, but sometimes when I drive through these streets at night, I could smell the pain of all of these people living in here. I could smell how all these people are just trapped in their lives, uh, their day-to-day -day lives. I guess we'll begin with this unfortunate little fact. While walking his dogs late night in the back alleys of his hometown in Nashville, it's always going to come back to Nashville, Kareen saw a bunch of trash laying about in what he imagined to be a war zone. This feels kind of unrelated to what comes next, but overhead lights acted as spotlights and made the scene more dramatic. He remarked that the trash started to resemble a human form, beaten, abused, and very humpable. I just don't know about that. As a teen in Nashville, Kareen remembered a group of elderly peeping Toms. He described them as the neighborhood boogeymen who worked at the Krispy Kreme and would cover themselves in shrubbery and dirt to peep through the windows of the other neighbors. And I find that fact absolutely chilling. But those two ideas together became the story for Trash Humpers. <laughs> Being a child of the 80s, obviously Kareen grew up with the incredible rise of the VHS, which still has a hold on me. It became the medium for trash humpers. Quote, there's a strange beauty in analog. You almost have to squint to see through the grain. There's something sinister about it. He used two VCRs to cut the film to make it feel more random. I wanted kind of an incidental awkwardness, like maybe the guy taping it had to turn it off and on. He said he wanted the film to feel like a found footage or artifact and even contemplated leaving it in random places like bus stops to see if someone would just stumble upon it. He searched for only the cheapest and worst VHS cameras from thrift stores. It meant he wouldn't be worried about lighting or other important aspects of filmmaking. He also said he didn't want the characters to look realistic. The actors, while looking old and wearing masks that resemble senior citizens, they do not move as such, making the film feel way more unsettling. <laughs> Similar to the previous films, the script was a collection of written down ideas and filming only lasted a few weeks. Kareen sees this as an ode to vandalism. Quote, there can be a creative beauty in their mayhem and destruction. At the film's premiere in Toronto, the audience was told that the title was to be taken literally. And if there were people feeling the need to walk out, they were given plenty of warning. <laughs> That's it.
name's Aileen. My real name's Al, but truth be told, I ain't from this planet, y'all. Alien? Let's finish off quickly with Spring Breakers from 2012, where we follow four college students as they hold up a restaurant in order to fund their spring break vacation. While partying, drinking, and doing drugs, they're arrested only to be bailed out by an arms dealer. I was sitting there looking out for all the motherfucking police. And we in the back, we just opened the door and we go, these motherfuckers! Hands on the motherfucking Get your motherfucking knees on the motherfucking ground, you piece of shit. motherfuckers down, motherfucker, down! Get on your fucking knees, Faith. Get on your fucking knees! Get your motherfucking knees on the fucking ground! Harmony Kareen said he wanted the film to appear as a mixture between a Britney Spears music video and a Gaspar Noé film. Which is fitting, because we'll be diving more into Noé in an upcoming video. This film also, coincidentally, has a feature of Every Time by Britney Spears. Rangers our love was strong. Why carry on without me? Every time I try to fly, I fall without my wings. For Corrine, this film is a personal atonement to him because he never enjoyed spring break. For me, this was more of a vicarious outsider watch because like Corrine, I too never partook in spring break activities. He refers to this film as beach noir and themes were continued in the following film, The Beach Bum from 2019. Gucci Mane, the rapper, was asked to be in the film while he was in prison. He agreed to take the role as soon as he was out. We love commitment. There is a, a very memorable blowjob scene in this movie. If you guys remember with James Franco, it was completely improvised. Corrine suggested the girls emasculate Alien, played by James Franco, by sticking the barrel of the gun in his mouth. It was Franco's idea that Alien would be turned on by the action, leading him to perform oral sex on the gun. Speaking of James Franco, let's talk more about the cast of the film. Good girls gone bad, if you will. Rachel Corrine, yes, Harmony's wife. Ashley Benson from Pretty Little Liars. Vanessa Hudgens and Selena Gomez, who both came from Disney. Wholesome girls turn rebellious girls in predicaments you would have never seen them get into on a regular Tuesday evening. So like I mentioned, we're going to just have a quick wrap up with Umshimi Wam, which is featuring Diane Ward, uh, Yolandi, and Ninja. And this is a short film about the compiled shenanigans of an eccentric South African couple with wheelchairs and guns and their attempts to prove they're not to be trifled with. And as I told you in the beginning of this film, I told you not to forget about Nashville. This was filmed in Nashville. Everything comes back to Nashville. Come, let's fuck off. It's nice. Eh? 